we are working through the Pentateuch in our new series, now 35 classes deep, uh, called The Pentateuch, A New Look. We're in the book of Bamidbar. We are in, ladies and gentlemen, the wilderness. We're in the book of Numbers. We're working through chronologically as best we can, closely following the annual cycle of readings. Israel spent, according to our sources, 40 years in the wilderness. The question that I want to look at today, I've called this class Another Time and Place. You'll see why. But the question becomes, how much of that 40 years do our sources convey? When we read the Pentateuch, particularly from the book of Exodus, chapter 12, 13, 14, all the way through the end of Deuteronomy, how much of the 40-year period is covered? We get quite a few stories. We get long blocks of narrative, but think about 40 years. That's a long time. So we have to wonder how much of that 40-year period is represented in the sources that make up the Pentateuch, the time that Israel spent in the wilderness, Vamidbar, in the wilderness, from the time they leave Egypt until under Joshua's leadership they cross into the promised land is identified by our sources as taking 40 years. They spend 40 years, and we all know why, it's associated directly to or the result of their unfaithfulness. The children of Israel were unfaithful, and therefore they spent additional time. The Pentateuch, particularly because, let me, let me put it this way, they spend this 40 years in the wilderness, according to the sources, particularly because they followed the fears of naysayers among the so-called spies. We just went through this not very long ago. Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 14, and a section in Deuteronomy chapter 1 deal with these scouts who went into the land to check it out ahead of the children of Israel who were planning to go in, at least that was some plan, uh, but some of those spies came back with a negative report the people trusted in that as opposed to the positive report of Joshua, Ben Nun, and uh, uh, Caleb. So ultimately, what do you have? 40 years in the wilderness. Now, everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. But we're going to look at this 40 years. We're going to take a closer look at this 40 years in the wilderness. And I want to begin in the book of Numbers chapter 14. So go back with me. A little bit, we covered this, but I want to touch on a few points to bring us to the place where we want to go today. Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 33. Um, but your carcasses shall drop in this wilderness. I'm reading from the JPS today. While your children roam the wilderness for 40 years, suffering for your faithlessness until the last of your carcasses is down in the wilderness. You shall bear your punishment for 40 years, corresponding to the number of days, 40 days, that you scouted the land a year for each day. Thus you shall know what it means to thwart me. I, Jehovah, have spoken. Thus will I do to all that wicked band that is banded together against me in this very wilderness. They shall die to the very last man. So we can tell that God's anger is burning, as the Hebrew Bible puts it. He says they have basically thwarted him. They've disobeyed. They've been felt faithless. And as a result of that, that entire generation will die in the wilderness. All right, now I want you to look at Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. And we're going to see another passage about this 40 years in the wilderness. Numbers 32, 32 verse 13. The Lord 
was incensed at Israel, and for 40 years he made them wander in the wilderness until the whole generation that had provoked Jehovah's displeasure was gone. Now, uh, in this particular passage, it says he made them wander in the wilderness. Now, the root of wander, we get introduced to this word very early in the Hebrew Bible. Remember when Cain is sent forth out of paradise, out of Eden, he says that God has made him a navanad, a fugitive and a wanderer. So na, nun, ayin, the root, it's like an, uh, an aimless wandering, right? So the question becomes uh, that one of the things that I want to ask you is, did the children of Israel spend 40 years wandering? You know, a lot of times you'll see this meme that's posted and it's Moses with a long string of people and it says, why did Moses wander for 40 years with the children of Israel? Because typically, like a man, he wouldn't ask for directions. You've seen this little joke. Well, 40 years in the wilderness, the question, one of the questions is, were they wandering the whole time? Or was a lot of that time spent stationary? We're going to look at what the Bible has to say about that. But the idea of 40 years in the wilderness is found not only in the Pentateuch, not only in the first five books, but throughout the Bible, there are several passages, 12 to be precise, 12 passages which refer to the wilderness wandering period, or this 40-year period in the wilderness. And they are represented, this idea is represented in the Torah, the Pentateuch, in the prophets, and in the Psalms. So it's not just like it's one particular section of text that advocates or puts forward this idea of a 40-year wilderness period, but it's throughout the, the biblical text. So we're going to look at those. We're going to do sort of a quick survey to establish that according to the biblical records, Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years because some people don't even believe that. But we're going to see that the biblical writers support this idea, and I want you to go with me quickly through these. Exodus chapter 16. We're going to go all the way back to Exodus chapter 16, and I just want to read one verse. Verse 35, 16, 35, and it says, um, And the Israelites ate manna forty years until they came to a settled land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. All right, so this text says that the children of Israel uh, ate this bread from heaven that we, we learn about in the Pentateuch, uh, that they ate this for 40 years, meaning during the wilderness sojourn until they came to the border of Canaan. Now, interestingly enough, you should know this, but Exodus 16 is from another time and place. The title of my class, another time and place. How so? Remember, they haven't yet been 40 years in the wilderness at this point in the book of Exodus. Think about that. This, they're not even at Sinai yet. They're not even at Horeb. And this particular passage tells us that they ate it for 40 years. According to the chronology, the natural flow of the narratives in the text, we're only a year in at this point. Not even a We're a month in. Because they reached Sinai only uh, several days, you know, within the month after they depart. Okay. Now, we just read two other passages. So in your notes, you should have Exodus 16.35. You should have the two passages I read from Numbers, uh, chapter 14, verse 33-35, and then chapter 32 and verse 13. Now go with me to Deuteronomy, because some people might expect that Deuteronomy might be different on this point. But if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 2, we're going to see uh, the same figure. Deuteronomy 2, let's start with verse 7. Indeed, the Lord your God has blessed you in all your undertakings. He's watched over your wanderings through this great wilderness. The Lord your God has been with you these past 40 years. You've lacked nothing. 
Now, that is up for debate whether or not they lacked anything. You know, some people would argue based on the, the context that uh, they, they were lacking quite a few times in water and so forth. In fact, that's one of their gripes. Okay, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, and we're going to start, we're going to read um, <coughs> verse 2, Deuteronomy 8, 2. Remember the long way that the Lord your God has made you travel in the wilderness these past 40 years, that he might test you by hardships to learn what was in your hearts, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He subjected you to the hardship of hunger and then gave you manna to eat, which neither you nor your fathers had ever known, in order to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The clothes upon you did not wear out, nor did your feet swell these 40 years. So this indicates not only a 40-year period in the wilderness, but a 40-year period in the wilderness in which their needs were met. Clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't uh, cause their feet to swell, you know. Look at Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29 in verse uh, 5. Now, I think it's different in uh, the Hebrew. It's going to be verse 4 in the Hebrew. I led you through the wilderness 40 years. The clothes on your back did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. All right. Now, that's the Pentateuch. Clearly, in Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there are references to 40 years in the wilderness. Now, go with me to Joshua. We're going to look at Joshua chapter 5. We've got just a few more of these. Joshua chapter 5 and verse 6. Joshua 5, 6. For the Israelites had traveled in the wilderness 40 years until the entire nation, the men of military age who had left Egypt, had perished because they had not obeyed Jehovah. And Jehovah had sworn never to let them see the land that Jehovah had sworn to their fathers to assign to us a land flowing with milk and honey. But he had raised up their sons in their stead, and it was these that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, not having been circumcised on the way. I pointed this out before, but it's interesting that the sign of the covenant from all the way back to Abraham in the book of Genesis is not followed in the wilderness. We have a text that says uh, right here, in fact, uh, right above in, in Joshua chapter 5, it says that when they left Egypt, all of the males were circumcised, but no one was circumcised in the 40 years of the wilderness. So that's another interesting study. Why is that? All right. Now, because remember, that's what brings a person into the covenant according to the text. Deuteronomy, by the way, only knows of the circumcision of heart. Only knows of the circumcision of heart. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and Deuteronomy chapter 30. There's no other circumcision mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. Now go with me to the book of Nehemiah. To the book of Nehemiah, and I want you to look at uh, chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. In chapter 9, we're going to look at verse 21. Forty years, says Nehemiah, you sustained them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing, their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Clearly, Nehemiah is referencing a Deuteronomy text, right? Because the only one who records this is Deuteronomy. Uh, Exodus doesn't mention anything about clothes and shoes. The book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers doesn't mention it, only Deuteronomy, which tells me that Nehemiah is drawing from a Deuteronomy text. Now we're going to go to the Psalms. I want you to go to uh, Psalm 95, Psalm 95, and we're going to begin in verse 8, because this intersects 
not only the 40 years, but something else we're going to cover in today's teaching. Uh, do not be stubborn as at Meribah, as on the day of Massah in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test, tried me, though they had seen my deeds. Forty years I was provoked by that generation. I thought they are a senseless people. They would not know my ways. Concerning them, I swore in anger, they shall never come to my resting place. So this is, uh, the psalmist is referring back to the material that we're going to cover today. Not only the 40 years, but the waters of Meribah. We're going to talk about that at length today. Now, go with me to the prophet Amos. The prophet Amos. I want you to look at chapter 2. Amos chapter 2. And uh, we're going to look at verse... 10, and I, Amos 2.10, brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you through the wilderness 40 years to possess the land of the Amorites. Now, by the way, literally in the Hebrew, he says, I walked with you 40 years. All right, now look at Amos chapter 5. This is going to be an interesting passage. Amos chapter 5. Verse 22, if you offer me burnt offerings or your meal offerings, I will not accept them. I will pay no heed to your gifts of fatlings. Spare me the sound of your hymns. Let me not hear the music of your lutes, but let justice well up like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. Did you offer me sacrifices and oblation those 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel. Did you hear that last verse? It's a question. Jehovah, through the prophet Amos, is talking about this 40-year period in the wilderness, clearly fed up with the external elements of religion. And then the question is, did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness? Forty years in the wilderness. Now, you would think that the obvious answer to that is, well, of course we did. It says right there in the text. That's another class. Now, what do we think about when we think about the 40 years in the wilderness? How much of that 40-year period is covered in the narratives that we have in the Pentateuch. Do we have enough information? Do we have enough detail chronologically and geographically to know when and where we are in that 40-year period? In other words, as we read a story such as we're going to read today, do we know where we are in the text? In, in places, it's very, very clear. The children of Israel, Numbers chapter 10, verse 11, the cloud lifts, I'm narrating, but I'm not quoting. Uh, the cloud lifts and it says that the children of Israel left in a certain date. It gives the date, the second year, the 20th day. You know, we get certain points along the way. But how much of that do we really know? Our job is not only to study the sources, but to put ourselves in the text to know where we are chronologically and geographically. And today, we're going to do that, and that's going to be a big part of what we talk about. Numbers chapter 14 is where we get the sentence of 40 years in the wilderness. And the you'll recall we just read this. The idea is that they spent 40 days on a scouting expedition. The general consensus of the group was a very negative appraisal. A, we can't do it. We can't take it. It's impossible. And because of that, for every day that that wilderness scouting team went into the land to check it out, for each of the days, the punishment is uh, distributed at a day for a year. 
Now, we're going to recap a little bit about what we know chronologically, where we are in the text at any given point. So I'm going to quickly go through a few things. Go with me back to Exodus 16. Uh, In fact, I won't read this yet. I'll just tell you. From Exodus 16 to Numbers chapter 10, verse 11, that is, from the time that they come to the wilderness region of Sinai, you know, if you if you read Exodus 16 and following, you get those locations that seem to be around what we know as Sinai Horeb. You have Rephidim, you have all these places. You're in the region. So from that time, they're staying in this area around Horeb, around Sinai for about a year. Numbers chapter 10, verse 11 gives us another date. And in fact, we can go there just so you make sure that you have these in your notes. Uh, Now remember, Numbers chapter 10, Numbers chronologically is not quite in order. We know that because of what the text says, and it's not just my speculation. In fact, I'll read you Numbers chapter 1. On the first day of the second month in the second year following the exodus from the land of Egypt, The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. First day, second month, second year. Now go to chapter 9. In uh, chapter 9, we get another reference for a date. Chapter 9, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai on the first new moon of the second year. Now notice this is the first month of the second year in chapter 9, whereas chapter 1 is the first day of the second month. So they're flipped, at least chronologically. This is what I want you to notice. Now go to chapter 10. In chapter 10, verse 11, second year, in the second year, on the 20th day of the second month. So now we're in the second year, second month, 20th day. All right, so we're moving forward in time. You follow me? We're only two years into this thing. Now, how long are we in the wilderness? 40 years. So this is the early start of this thing. Everybody follow me so far? Pretty easy. It's easy, right? So when the cloud lifts, let's say we're entering year two. Entering year two of 40. Now, what we're going to do is, from Numbers chapter 10, we're going to take a look at the chronology as the text helps us and see where we're at when we get to the point that today's reading happens in. Now, if you follow through, and I'm just going to talk you through a bit of this, if you follow through chapter 10, the next thing that happens after the cloud lifts is, we get a block of text which tells us the way that the tribes move, the order, the arrangement. You know, this tribe, uh, verse 17, the tabernacle would be taken apart. Gershonites, the Merorites who carried the tabernacle would set out. The next standard to set out, troop by troop. was. So it's just telling us, it's giving us information, right? We assume that this is right there, the second uh, second year, 20th day of the second month. This, is, this isn't a change in date. It's just telling us how the children of Israel moved out. Uh, if you go down to verse 29, same story. You have the father-in-law of Moses, basically, and he is being requested. Moses is requesting that the in-laws, who know that desert, go with the children of Israel and be their eyes in the wilderness. See, because they've not ventured away from Horeb and Sinai, see? They've been there for about a year. Moses' point is, hey, you, uh, you people of Midian are, are the desert people. You could really be helpful to us. You could be our eyes, all right? Again, nothing there. Now, verse 33, they marched from the mountain of the Lord a distance of three days. So based on what we read in Numbers chapter 10, we're basically, I think it's safe to say, it's the 23rd day of the second year, second month, right? It's three days from the time we had our last date. This is right there. We're early in the 40 years. Now, when you get down 
to chapter 11. I'm just going to quickly go through these. You have a mention of a place. Remember, we're talking about uh, geography and chronology. Verse 3 says that uh, there's this, this event that happens, and the place was called uh, Tabara. Tabara. All right, so what is, wh- where are we at chronologically? What we get here is not so much chronology. We do get another story, though. We assume that we're in the same, you know, they just left and they come to this place. They're complaining. We don't really get a lot of information about where we are chronologically. But it says, uh, remember the story they had a craving for Egyptian food? You ever have a craving for a certain kind of food? Some of you might not crave Egyptian, but you might say, man, I sure need some Mexican food, or I may need this kind of food or that kind of food. Uh, But they were craving this Egyptian food. And then you have the story of the quail in Numbers chapter 11. Now, when you get down to verse 34, you get some more places. Um, This is right at the story, though. It's the same context. The quail come. They eat the quail. Verse 33. The meat was still between their teeth, nor uh, nor yet chewed when the anger of Jehovah blazed forth against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a severe plague. That place was called Kibrot Hatava, because the people who had the craving were buried there. Then the people set out from Kibrot Hatava for Hatzerot. Now, any indication of time here? Not really, but do you think it's been years or do you think it's just been, I mean, it seems like it's just, bottom line is we don't know. Now, chapter 12, when they were in Hatserot, why do we say this? Well, the previous verse says they're in Hatserot. Now, right here it says, when they were in Hatserot, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. You remember this? They challenged Moses because of his Cushite woman and uh, that Miriam is inflicted with uh, um, leprosy as it's translated. Her skin turns white. You know, various commentators wonder why does her skin turn white? Some suggest that it's a punishment for her prejudice against the Cushite woman, presumably of darker skin. So you want to be white? Here, how about this? I'll make you really, really white. Uh, But be that as it may, what we do get in verse 15 of chapter 12, they're at Hatzerot. We know this. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people didn't march on until Miriam was readmitted. After that, the people set out from Hatzerot, and they encamped in the wilderness of Paran. So now we we, we had one reference beyond Numbers chapter 10 that said, They went three days, and then we've got Miriam shut out the camp. Now, I'm willing to suggest that it's more than this, uh, if you just added uh, the seven days of Miriam being shut out and the three days, that's only 10 days. So we're probably moving into that second year, this progress here. You know, we're somewhere well into this now, but we're not getting a lot of help chronologically. It says that they're encamped in the wilderness of Paran. Now, remember in Numbers chapter 10, verse 11, I'm just going to flip back there for a moment. Uh, It says that in the second year, on the 20th day of the second month, the cloud lifted from the tabernacle of the pack, and the Israelites set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sinai. The cloud came to rest in the wilderness of Paran. Now, notice that verse 16 of chapter 12 the, the wilderness of Paran is mentioned. So it's like these go together, the story from chapter 11, verse 10, through chapter 12, verse 16, is a literary block, right? Here's what we know about the cloud and pillar and the movement of the children of Israel according to the priestly sources. They're not waiting on a word from God to move. Deuteronomy uses that language. But in the priestly sources, the cloud is always what guides. When the cloud moves, the children of Israel move. Where it stops, they stop. Now you get the impression 
that perhaps the cloud goes ahead. We get this in the text, actually, not an impression. We read it. The cloud goes ahead and stations where they're going. So it's almost like you could, if you take off, the cloud gets there before you do. You see the cloud move and stop, and you move. And the whole group moves. That's why the, the Pentateuch often will say, and the, the uh, children of Israel came in one body to the next location, right? It's a movement. So um, this is where they're going next. It's where it said they were going for their first block of move from the Sinai Horeb region to the wilderness of Paran, and that's where they are. Now we get into chapter 13 is about the so-called spies. I say so-called, all right? They're scouting. Now remember last uh, week we talked about we have different sources within the Pentateuch that describe the sending forth of the scouts. Whose idea was it? Was it Moses' idea? Did God command Moses to send forth spies? Or did the children of Israel send a delegation to Moses and say, hey, we were thinking maybe we should send some scouts ahead of us to check this out. And Moses said, you know, that idea seems good to me uh, because we get both stories in the Pentateuch. We have both, all right? One says one, one says another. But 13, chapter 13, is a story about the spies. Look at verse 3. Moses, by the Lord's command, al pi Yehovah, according to Jehovah's mouth, sent them out from the wilderness of Paran, all the men being leaders of Israelites. So where are they at when the spies go forth? Wilderness of Paran. Now, can we get more specific? Yes, and we will. But they're in the wilderness of Paran, and from the wilderness of Paran, having just come from Hatzerot, where Miriam was locked out of the camp for seven days until she was readmitted, we still, would you think we're pretty early in the narrative? Of course we're pretty early in the narrative. It only makes sense that we're early in the narrative. Look at 13, chapter 13, verse 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from scouting the land. They went straight to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran, and they made their report to them and to the whole community as they showed them the fruit of the land. This is what they told him. We came to the land you sent us to. Uh, Let me see where I want to go right now. I'm going to pick this up in a minute. Let me stop for a second. So now they're in Kadesh. They're in the wilderness of Paran. You go from Sinai, you move up in the narrative, and you you make your next stop, and then you go to Chatzirot, and then you go to the wilderness of Paran to a place called Kadesh. That's where we are now, and it's from Kadesh. In the wilderness of Paran, we know, basically, we know where the Wadi Paran is. We know where the wilderness of Paran is. It's in the northern section of the Sinai, if you will, if you want to talk about Sinai and the peninsula. It's in the northern region. So here we are, and this is from whence the the spies are sent forth. Now, chapter 13 covers this as well as chapter 14. Look at verse uh, 27, where I left off. This is what they told him. We came to the land you sent us to. It does indeed flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who inhabit the land are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the Anakites there. Amalekites dwell in the Negev region. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites inhabit the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. Caleb hushed the people before Moses and said, Let us by all means go up. We shall gain possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We cannot attack that people. It's stronger than we. Thus they spread calumnies among the Israelites about the land which they had scouted, saying, The country that we traversed and scouted is one that devours its settlers. All the people that we saw in it are men of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites are part of the Nephilim. And we look like grasshoppers to ourselves. And so we must have looked to them. 
All right, so they lay it on heavy. They talk about the giants they saw and how scary it was and the fact that there's no way they could make it. You get into chapter 14, and the sentence is issued because of this. If you look at verse 26, and the Lord spoke further to Moses and Aaron, how much longer shall that wicked community keep muttering against me? Very well. I've heeded the incessant mutterings of the Israelites against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I will do to you just as you have urged me. In this very wilderness shall your carcasses drop. All of you who were recorded in your various lists from the age of 20 and up, you who have muttered against me, not one settle you, save Caleb son of Yephuneh and Joshua son of Nun, your children who said, uh, who you said would be carried off, these will I allow to enter. They shall know the land that you've rejected, but your carcasses will drop in the wilderness while your children roam the wilderness for 40 years, suffering for your faithfulness, faithlessness until the last of your carcasses is down in the wilderness. You shall bear your punishment for 40 years, corresponding to the number of days, 40 days that you scouted the land a year for each day. Now, the reason I read that again is because I want you to understand where we are chronologically. They're issued a sentence of 40 years in the wilderness, and we're a couple of years in. Would you agree with that? Probably. We don't know exactly. We know they leave in the second year, 20th day, second month. We know that. We know certain things chronologically. Now you get a 40-year sentence. Now, I'm going to go above and beyond and say they get credit for time served, right? You've been in the wilderness for 40 years because you can imagine some of them going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, but we've been here two years already. So does that mean 42 or... You know, they're trying to figure it out. It's like Daniel in chapter 9 trying to figure out the length of the 70-day prophecy. Did it start here? And some of you do that as well, right, Chuck, my good friend? Okay, so the idea is 40 years in the wilderness and time served, you're given credit for. Now, what we want to do now is we want to work through and try to figure. Again, we're early in the narrative. Verse 39 through 45, I'm just going to tell you, the children of Israel, once this sentence comes down, they realize, wait a minute, we chose, we didn't choose wisely. We should have gone in. Tell you what we'll do. We're going to go in now. But, you know, and, and they're told, mm, no, it's too late. You don't want to go in now because you'll be beat. And that's what happens. And then what you read is, is that they do try to go in. They do get beat down by the Amalekites and the Canaanites, etc. And, and what you get is a shattering blow, and the place is referred to as Hormah. And we've got another story about Hormah and the Pentateuch that I'm not going to go into today. The question for you for homework, write this down, is look up Hormah, H-O-R-M-A-H, and see if this could be describing something similar, or is there more than one place called Hormah? In this one, the Israelites are routed. In another story about Hormah, the Israelites are victorious. So we have to wonder uh, what's going on there. But it could just be that that's a name applied because Hormah means destruction, basically. So you're like, yeah, it's a, I would call this place destruction. All right, chapter 15. We have various laws given. There's no real indication of chronology. So a lot of this is priestly. Um, you're going to present offering by fire to the Lord from the herd of the flock, be it burnt offering, sacrifice, vows, etc. Uh, you know, you, you can read through chapter 15. It's all about sacrifices and offerings. Remember Amos' question in Amos chapter 5, verse 22 through 25. Did you offer me offerings and sacrifices in the wilderness in those 40 years? And the person who reads Numbers 15 says, yes, we did. Okay, that's for another class. But the idea is that we don't get a lot of chronology in 15. Now, if you look at, you go down through the narrative, you get to verse 32. From 32 to 36, there's a narrative block there, and it's about a guy that's picking up sticks on the Sabbath. 
And they didn't know what to do about this. They never encountered this. So the decision is made, kill him. All right. So just that's the, the plain answer there. Just uh, the man shall be put to death and everybody's going to pelt him with stones outside the camp. So, the, But this doesn't give us any chronology. We assume that it happens after the issuances of this uh, story about various um, uh, sacrifices and stuff. And then you get to chapter uh, 15, 30, verse 37 through 41, and we're dealing with uh, a, a statute, if you will, a law uh, about the fringes on the garments and the purpose therefore. But no, uh, no indication about time, right? Uh, but it just basically is that you're going to put these fringes and look on them, and it's going to remind you uh, to keep the commandments, etc. Okay, moving right along, how far are we into this? We assume we're early in the 40 years. Would you say we're into the second year, but maybe not much further? Then we have this rebellion, Korok and Datan, and Aviram, and oh, by the way, 250 others, and there's this, uh, uh, this confrontation with Moses. Now remember, I talked about this in last week's class, uh, about these different sources that we have, and we went into that at length, so I'm not going to go into that, other than to say, <clears throat> in chapter 16, we have the rebellion, we have story about fire pans, the earth opening up, fire killing the rebels, but there's really no indication of time passage. We don't get any chronological clues. We assume that we're still fairly early in. Don't know how early. But now you get into chapter 17, seems to be a continuation of the rebellion narrative motif. You get more rebellion challenging specifically in this case the priesthood of Aaron. And so you have another story about the fire pans. You have the staff and, and the staff that budded, etc. But there's really no indication of time. We don't get any chronological clues in 17. I think we're still early in the narrative, but we don't know. We just don't know. Now, years passed, and up until recently, I would have read this all chronologically as this is the next thing to happen, and then the next day they get up, and then the next, you know, that was just something I thought as I read it. But as I get into the text and I take a new look at the Pentateuch, I begin to question some of these things, at least in terms of where and when do they fall into the 40-year period that the biblical writers um, ensure us was a big part of uh, the narrative history of the Pentateuch. Now we get to chapter 18. Still, no real indication that we've moved far along in the text in terms of chronology. Chapter 18 is various laws associated with the Levites and so forth. We get to chapter 19 and we're dealing with the red heifer. It's called uh, a chok. The Chukat is the name of the Torah portion here. We're dealing with the red heifer. There's really no indication at time, but it is interesting to me that if you look at verse 3, you shall give it to Eliezer the priest, and it will be taken outside the camp. I have a question mark in my Bible. Uh, why Eliezer? Aaron is the high priest at this point. Now, in chapter 20... Aaron turns things over to Eliezer in a ceremony leading up to Aaron's death, which we're going to talk about. But at the time, when you read this, it should strike us, though admittedly, it didn't really hit me until recently. And I thought, why Eliezer? Unless this is a plan to prepare for the succession of leadership. And that's perfectly acceptable to me. In other words, you think uh, any good organization or good team is always looking at the leadership succession. So you think, okay, God knows that Aaron is about to be killed, so um, we need to train the next guy. So, you know, can you imagine Aaron sitting there and he hears this, uh, bring the red cow to Eliezer, and Aaron's like, what? why not bring it to me? Well, that's because chapter 20 is going to tell him what happens. So when you get to 20, 
Look at chapter 20 and verse 1. The Israelites arrived in a body at the wilderness of Sin on the first new moon, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Okay, now, now we've got a date. Now we've got a date finally, but it's not complete. All we have is, we know it's the, the first new moon. So that's some year, the first new moon. The first month of question mark year. Now, but notice the people arrived and they stayed at Kadesh. So it says they arrived in the wilderness of Sin. Now we have to wonder, wait a minute, this could this still be early? So the first new moon, would you think maybe we're in the third year? Look, a lot happens in chapter 20. Get ready. Uh, the question is, we know where we are geographically. We are in the wilderness of Zen. They're staying at Kadesh. Go back, hold your hand here, but look at Numbers 13, Numbers 13, verse 21. This is talking about the spies, remember? They went up and scouted the land from the wilderness of Zen to Rehov. All right. Now look down at verse 25. At the end of 40 days, they returned from scouting the land. They went straight to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. Chapter 20 is telling us about when they arrived, the wilderness of Zen at Kadesh. So would you think we're still early? So let's say that this is the first new moon would you go with me and say you, the natural assumption is, is that we're in the third year? Third year. That's what I'm going to go with. All right? Now, we have to know that we don't have a lot to go on here. The first new moon, remember chapter 10, verse 11 says they were in the second year, the 20th day of the second month. So to be in the first month, you can't be the second year unless this goes back prior. It's got to move forward. So the first logical first month of the new year would be year three. Now, that makes sense to me. But we really don't have a year. We don't have a year given. The narrative of chapter 20 tells us at the beginning that Miriam dies. It says Miriam died there and was buried there. And this is followed by quarreling over no water. Now look, there's many similarities between this story of no water and another story of no water. Let's look at this one first. Chapter 20, verse 7. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, You and your brother Aaron take the rod, assemble the community, and before their very eyes... Order the rock to yield its water. Thus you shall produce water for them from the rock and provide drink for the congregation and their beasts. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron assembled the congregation in front of the rock and said, Listen, you rebels. Listen up, you rebels. Shall we get water out of this rock for you? And Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And out came copious water, and the community and their beast drank. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me enough to affirm my sanctity in the sight of the Israelite people, therefore you shall not lead this congregation into the land that I have given them. Those are the waters of Meribah, meaning that the Israelites quarreled with the Lord through which he affirmed his sanctity. Look, listen up, you rebels. You're not going in. Now, people have wrestled with, are, what happened? Well, you say, well, he, did he say strike the rock? Not once, twice did he say strike the rock or did he just say speak to the rock? Some say it's because God told him to speak to the rock and he struck the rock. Others say uh, he didn't have faith enough in God's people and he, he said, listen up, you rebels. And because he called 
The people rebel. God said, you guys rebelled. So that's especially painful if Moses called them a rebel and God said, you're the rebel because you hit that rock twice. Now, let's look at another story that sounds similar. Exodus 17, Exodus 17, verse 1 says, From the wilderness of sin, the whole Israelite community continued by stages as Jehovah would command. They encamped at Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses. Give us water to drink, they said. And Moses replied to them, Why do you quarrel against me? Why do you try Jehovah? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why would you bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? Moses cried out to Jehovah, saying, What shall I do with this people? Before long they'll be stoning me. And Jehovah said to Moses, Pass before the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel. Take along the rod, look, with which you struck the Nile and set out. So he he struck the Nile with it, right? This rod is for striking. Struck the Nile. I'll be standing there before you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will issue from it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. The place was called Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tried the Lord saying, is the Lord present among us or not? Take the rod. I'll be standing before you there on the rock at Horeb. By the way, are they at Horeb? They must be close. They really arrive at Horeb in chapter 19, but Rephidim must be close. And it says to strike the rock. So they're told, strike the rock, Moses and water is going to come out. So Moses used his staff to strike the Nile, to strike the, to now, and then he tells him, speak. You got to, you got to listen. Listen closely. Now, the interesting thing to me, the staff of Moses is a mate. It's called mate in chapter 17 of Exodus, called mate of Numbers chapter 20. It appears that this could be the staff, Moses' staff. Now, in 17, he strikes a tzur, sadi vav resh. It's more, it says rock, but it's more like a crag, right? And then in uh, Numbers chapter 20, the word used is selah. So it's, there are some differences in the narrative. But what's interesting is that both of these talk about the waters of Meribah. Now you say, well, it's seen, it clearly is two different incidents, and I'm not suggesting it isn't. But let's think about the waters of Meribah. There are nine references, nine references in the Bible to the waters of Meribah. All right, we have Exodus 17, we just read. Numbers chapter 20, we just read. And we're going to go through the others. And what I want you to do, this is a self-test. Get your pens ready. You people here, get your pens ready. I'm going to take these up at the end of the class. Uh, I want you to do this. Make two columns, Exodus 17, Numbers chapter 20. And as I read these, I want you to go, that refers to one or the other. You follow me? Do it how you want, but I'm going to check them. Numbers chapter 27. Let's see if this is easy or hard. Numbers 27, Uh, verse 14. For in the wilderness of Zin... When the community was contentious, you disobeyed my command to uphold my sanctity in their sight by the means of the water. Those are the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Sin. All right, which one am I talking about? Exodus 17 or Numbers chapter 20? Should be easy. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 8. And of Levi, he said, let your Tumim and your Urim be with your faithful one whom you tested at Massah, challenged at the waters of Meribah. Mm. These waters of Meribah, Exodus 17, Numbers chapter 20. Go to Psalm 81. Psalm 81. And we're going to look at verse 7. 81 and verse 7. Let me make sure it's not different in the Hebrew. It's verse 8 in the Hebrew. 
Let's look at this in verse 8 in Hebrew 7 in English. In distress, you called and I rescued you. I answered you from the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Relax, I'm really not taking these up, but I want you to play with it. 95, Psalm 95. Psalm 95 in verse 8. Do not be stubborn as at Meribah, as on the day of Messiah in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test, tried me, though they had seen my deeds. Forty years I was provoked by that generation, and I thought they were a senseless people. They would not have known my ways. Concerning them, I swore in my anger, they shall never come to my resting place. Waters of Meribah, Exodus 17, Numbers 20. And last one, Psalm 106, verse 32. Taking a new look at the Pentateuch, folks, they provoked wrath at the waters of Meribah, and Moses suffered on their account because they rebelled against him, and he spoke rashly. Ah. Now, Remember in Numbers chapter 20, I'm going to help you with this one a little bit, we said, why is it that this, listen up you rebels, got Moses disallowed from entering the land? The answer, at least according to the psalmist here in Psalm 106, is as I just read. So think about that. Now, if we go back to Numbers, and I, I want you to do that, go back to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. And listen up. I'm going to read, ver- listen up, you rebels. I'm going to read verse 22. I'm joking about the rebel part. Setting out from Kadesh, the Israelites arrived in, the, in body at Mount Hor. Where are we chronologically? They're leaving Kadesh. How long were they at Kadesh? All right. The Israelites arrived in a body at Mount Hor. At Mount Hor, on the boundary of the land of Edom, Jehovah said to Moses and Aaron, Let Aaron be gathered to his kin. He's not to enter the land that I have assigned to the Israelite people because you disobeyed my command about the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and his son Eleazar and bring them up on Mount Hor. Strip Aaron of his vestments and put them on his son Eleazar. Then Aaron shall be gathered unto the dead. Moses did as the Lord commanded. They ascended Mount Hor in the sight of the whole community. Moses stripped Aaron of his vestments, put them on his son Eleazar, and Aaron died on the summit of the mountain. When Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain, the whole community knew that Aaron had breathed his last, and all the house of Israel bewailed Aaron 30 days. Okay, so then we got a 30 year, 30 day period. The question is Aaron dies at Mount Hor, and Eliezer assumes the duty at this point. Now, remember in chapter 19, you know, the previous chapter, we get this statute of the red cow. And it's, uh, we're told to bring the cow to Eliezer, not Aaron. Well, now we might be able to make some sense of that. You know, you would think the top priest would be in charge of this ritual. Well, this is a transference that happened. And now Aaron is dead on Mount Hor. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 50. You shall die on the mountain that you are about to ascend, talking about Moses, and shall be gathered to your kin as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his kin. For you broke faith with me among the Israelite people at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin by failing to uphold my sanctity among the Israelite people. You can view the land from a distance, but you shall not enter it the land that I'm giving to the Israelite people. 
Geographically, according to what I've read, we're at Mount Hor. Any idea of where we are chronologically? Everything we've covered today, are we in the second, third year? Where are we at? Because we covered, remember, from chapter 10 through chapter 20, seems like the only date and chronological clues that we have seem to suggest we're still early in this thing. So the question is, does Aaron die early in the 40 years? Go with me to Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33. And I want to go to verse 36, 33, verse 36. And it says, They set out from Etzion Gever and encamped in the wilderness of Sin, that is Kadesh. They set out from Kadesh and encamped at Mount Hor on the edge of the land of the Edom. All right, now, by the way, Exodus, uh, Numbers 33 is presented as a wilderness itinerary, which a good exercise, and some claim they have done this with good results, and I, I want to see their papers truly, truly weigh them against what I've looked at because they you can compare Numbers 33 in the order of the itinerary with other places, like we're reading now in the book of Bar. We get an order there. Does it match this? It's an interesting study, and we may do that shortly. However, now look at verse 38. Aaron the priest ascended Mount Hor at the command of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the Israelites had left the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. And then it talks about the Canaanite king. The 40th year? What happened to the 38 years in the middle? Did we cover it that quickly? Here we read that they're, um, they're at the wilderness of Sin. They go to Kadesh and then to Mount Hor on the edge of the land of Edom. Now, does this mean that the first new moon of chapter 20 is the 40th year? Because if Numbers 33 says Aaron died at Mount Hor in the 40th year, fifth month, first day, then chapter 20 is covering a four-month period if it's the 40th year. And if it's the 40th year, then that means from chapter 10, verse 11 of Numbers, through the spy narrative, through up until you get to Numbers chapter 20, there's 38 years covered and only about four short narratives. The, mere, the meager narrative between 10 and 20 must represent 38 years, if that's the case. I mean, I'm okay with it. I'm just saying, remember I asked at the beginning is how much of the 40-year period is covered in the narrative sources that we have. Now, if this first new moon of 20 is the third year, then we only have of 38 years. If, it's, if the first new moon of 20 is the third year, which it seems like it might be as the narrative flows, then all we have for 38 years of coverage is the death of Miriam, the waters of Meribah, the death of Aaron. That could be it too. Now go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 2. We're not finished yet. Deuteronomy chapter 2. Thus, after you had remained at Kadesh all that long time, Remember I asked you, are they wandering in the wilderness for 40 years or are they stationary for a long part of that? Deuteronomy says, you've been at Kadesh a long time. Then we march back into the wilderness by the way the seer reads, uh, as Jehovah had spoken to me and skirted the hill country of Seir a long time. So they go around Har Seir 
a very many days is what the Hebrew says, many days. It doesn't say many years, many days. Then they turn north. Now look at verse 14, chapter 2, Deuteronomy, verse 14. Now, listen to this. The time that we spent in travel from Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the Wadi Zered was 38 years. Until that whole generation of warriors had perished from the camp as Jehovah had sworn concerning them. Okay. Literally, it's in the days which we walked from Kadesh Barnea until we passed over the Wadi Zered, 38 years. This seems to imply contra what we see in Numbers and what we see in Deuteronomy 2 verse 1. Uh, It seems that they're saying that it was a 38-year hike from Kadesh Barnea around and so forth. Numbers has Aaron die at Mount Hor after leaving Kadesh. The question is, does Deuteronomy tell us anything about Aaron's death? Deuteronomy mentions Aaron three times. The first one uh, that I already read, I'll get this one off the list, is Deuteronomy 32.50. Deuteronomy 32.50 says Aaron died on Mount Hor. Remember that? And he's telling Moses there, by the way, you're going to go up and die on this mountain like Aaron died on that one. Okay. The next one is Deuteronomy 9. Look at Deuteronomy 9. Deuteronomy 9 and verse 20. Moreover, the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to have destroyed him. So I also interceded for Aaron at that time. Remember the golden calf incident? God was so mad at Aaron. Now, there are a lot of traditions that say, you know, it wasn't Aaron's fault. You know, the traditional view is that those dirty old Gentiles that were traveling with the holy people, uh, they're the ones that did it. So that's what the tradition says, to get Aaron out of trouble. But Moses doesn't do that. Moses said, God was so mad at Aaron He almost killed him, but I had to step in. Now, the next reference to Aaron, go with me to Deuteronomy 10 and verse 6. From Berot Beni Yakan, the Israelites marched to Moserah. Aaron died there and was buried there, and his son Eliezer became priest in his stead. From there they marched to Good God, and from Good God to Japhat, a region of running brooks. Now, this is an interesting passage, verse 6 and 7. Look look above, work with me here. Look look at verse 3 of chapter 10. Moses, first person. I made an ark of acacia wood, carved out two tablets of stone like the first. I took the two tablets with me and went up the mountain. The Lord inscribed on the tablets the same text as on the first, the Ten Commandments that He addressed to you on the mountain, out of the fire, on the day of assembly, Jehovah gave them to me. Then I left and went down the mountain, and I deposited the tablets in the ark that I had made, where they still are, as Jehovah had commanded me. A couple of interesting things. Moses makes an ark. In Deuteronomy, the only ark mentioned is the one that Moses makes. The rest of the Pentateuch talks about one made by Bezalel and Aholiab. But here he says that he puts in the ark, and then the next thing says, from Berot Beni Yaakon, the Israelites march to Moserah. It's totally separate. I mean, it's a different narrative altogether. Um, and then notice it's, it's just this description of these places Then verse 8, and at that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the Lord's covenant, to stand in attendance, etc. Then verse 10 picks up again the narrative. I had stayed on the mountain as I did the first time, 40 days and 40 nights. Now if you go back and you read uh, verse 3 through 5 and then pick up in verse 10, very interesting that it flows perfectly. Remember, we have narrative sources that are pulled together in the Pentateuch as we now have it. This is an interesting case because here it says that Moses, I mean, that Aaron dies at a place called Moserah. 
And, and some say, yeah, well, that's just another name for Mount Hor. Deuteronomy knows how to tell us Mount Hor. It does so in chapter 32, verse 50. But here it says Moserah. Now, look with me. For those who say that this is just another name for Mount Hor, look at chapter 33 of Numbers. Numbers 33, and let's look at verse 30. <clears throat> They set out from Hashmonan and camped at Moserot. Ah, that sounds familiar. They set out from Moserot and encamped at Beni Yakin. They set out from Beni Yakin and encamped at Hor Hagidgod. They set out from Hor Hagidgod and encamped at Jotbat. These names are very similar to what we find in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. I propose that these are variations of those names, and the location of Aaron's death is given to us in the Pentateuch as two different, from two different sources. Now look at chapter 33 of Numbers, verse 40. Well, let's, let's go ahead and read verse 38 again, 33, 38. Aaron the priest ascended Mount Hor at the command of the Lord and died there in the 40th year after the Israelites had left the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. Aaron was 123 years old when he died on Mount Hor. And the Canaanite king of Arad, who dwelt in the Negev in the land of Canaan, learned of the coming of the Israelites. Aaron dies, king of Arad story. Aaron dies, king of Arad. Go back to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. Now remember verse 27 through 29 tells us that Aaron died. Look what the next thing happens. Look at chapter 21. When the Canaanite King of Arad, who dwelt in the Negev, learned that Israel was coming by the way of the Atarim. He engaged Israel in battle and took some of them captive. So what we're going to do is we're now looking at the narratives all lines up again. There were some difficulties there, but now we're bringing it. Our sources are in agreement. Wherever Aaron died, whether it was a place called Moserah or Mount Hor, after he dies... There's a, an issue, a battle, if you will, with the king of Arad. Now we're back on. Now the questions that we've raised are worth considering because we want to get this right. We want to understand how much of the 40-year period do our narratives uh, divulge to us? Do we have time in there where the children of Israel were not... Now, of course, you couldn't give 40 years. I mean, I like to carry my Bible everywhere I go. Uh, but if you had every detail of 40 years, all the books in this library wouldn't be able to fit it. So I realize you can't have everything. But what is striking is that if you align the text horizontally, it appears that we get a heavy concentration of events that take place early in the 40 years. And then we pick up after a long hiatus of no uh, real narrative, we pick up in the 40th year. Not that this is a problem, it's just an observation. We have to recognize where we are chronologically and geographically as we read these stories. So when Deuteronomy says that Israel abode at Kadesh many days, is it 38 years? Or were they wandering? Because you have both suggestions from the text. But here with the king of Arad in Numbers 21, the sources begin to come back in alignment. We're going to have... Uh, a good bit of information on that 40th year as we push through the remaining sections of the book of Numbers. And then we're going to obviously go into the book of Deuteronomy next, which is going to be incredibly fun and exciting. 
But we're going to need to pick up next week without Miriam, without Aaron, and presumably, almost without a doubt, in the 40th year already of the wilderness wanderings. We're going to be in the 40th year, and I think that what you're going to find is that we've got what we have. We have the stories that we have. We have limited coverage of that 40-year period, and some of what we have was written in another time and another place. Don't miss next week. Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov. Check it out. Same time, same channel. Wherever you're listening to me now, you can find me next Saturday. Have a beautiful week.